Bob Rivard. He is... Oh, come on, really? Really? I'm kidding. He is the co-founder of the Rivard Report and author of Trail of Feathers, Searching for Philip True, great book about the 1998 disappearance and the murder of Express News reporter Philip True in Mexico's Sierra Madre Mountains and the four years spent pursuing his killers. He also happened to work for the Express News back in the day. He doesn't say that in his official bio. He is also the founding captain, though, of the Third Street Grackle Cycling Team. Really? <laughs> he is married to Monica Mackley, founder of San Antonio's annual Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. They have two sons, Nicola, Nicola, Nicola. Nicola and Alex, who live and work in San Antonio, please give it up for the young, fashionable Robert River! Thank you, Beamer, that was so touching. I'm speaking tonight about family. This is actually a tale of two families. The one I escaped as a teenager and the one Monica Mackley and I started 37 years ago. So let's get it started. My, my brothers and I were born in the Lake Michigan town of Petoskey. There we are with my parents, Ken and Betty. We look normal enough in a 1950s sort of way, but we were far from it. That's me on the right. The angle of the photograph makes me look a little husky. <laughs> this is what conceptual sex in a Catholic family looked like back then. <laughs> Kenny was born December 8th. I was born November 17th. Pete was born November 7th. Three boys, 24 months. No wonder my mother eventually went crazy. Young parents out there in the audience will note the uh, advances in stroller design. One of my earliest memories is my mom telling me I was a big mistake. As if I needed periodic reminders, she arrived at my hospital bed after I had my tonsils removed with a black sheep. I don't know why my parents didn't have, stop having sex after me, but they didn't. Two girls followed us boys. Dad was a traveling salesman for Armor Star during the height of the Cold War. People like our neighbor Jim Mills were getting ready for World War III building underground bomb shelters. My dad sold cans of treat out of the trunk of his car to mom and pop grocers. He claimed they were radioactive proof. We ate a lot of it. One night at supper, I remarked, after the commies dropped the big one on us, Mr. Mills says we'll be living in bomb shelters eating that dog shit in a can you sell, dad. <laughs> my father erupted out the door, mom washed my, my mouth out with soap, and we could hear dad shouting and Mr. Mills laughing, telling him to stick a can of treat up his ass, which I didn't know was possible. Meet the Benders. We boys spent part of every summer working on their dairy farm in rural Michigan. We did chores from sunup to sundown and returned for free room and board. Our parents told us this was summer vacation. <laughs> Years passed before we learned our family didn't have any money and people who did defined summer vacation very differently. The Michigan News Agency offered us a Sunday newspaper route. Kenny handled the money, I handled the sales. I like knocking on doors and talking to strangers. Before loading up our bikes, we read what we delivered. Kenny liked the comics. I liked news from faraway cities and fantasized about becoming a reporter one day. Then in November 1963, we loaded up the station wagon and with no advance warning moved to New York. No time for goodbyes. Days later, I was connecting the TV in our news ho new house when Walter Cronkite announced President Kennedy had been assassinated. My boyhood died that week. The next five years in New York and Philadelphia, always following my dad's sales jobs, were dark ones. We learned by then my mother was a nurse long addicted to narcotics, eventually busted for forged scripts. Years of physical and mental abuse at her hands as the family's black sheep led me to leave for good as I was about to turn 17. Nobody tried to stop me. I was heading in the wrong direction in life and was deferred to an experimental high school class called SNAP. That stood for Superior Non-Achieving Pupils. A teacher named Mike Walker changed my life. He taught self-esteem to kids who grew up without any. 
He also gave me a place to sleep as a teenager. I slowly began to glean new possibilities. Fast forward to 10 years, 10 years in Texas where I was living my dream as a newspaper reporter. I met Monica in a Dallas newsroom and thought I had won her heart, but then she moved to New York. I followed and found work as a writer at 60 Minutes. I didn't like TV news, Randy, so I left. Fortunately, Monica decided to move back. I had won her heart. She grew up in a loving family. John and Hilde, her parents, were German immigrants who gave me unconditional love. John taught me to hunt. Our oldest son, Nicholas, designed our Arsenal Street house with a cottage for them. Sadly, Opa died at age 93, but 86-year-old Oma is with us here tonight. We newlyweds moved to Central America where I covered the region's civil wars in the early 1980s for Newsweek magazine. The Reagan administration was propping up right-wing military regimes who were slaughtering tens of thousands of peasants and workers. This is one of them, lying for a single night in a borrowed coffin that poor neighbors shared. Those civil wars and the Cold War policies pursued back then reverberate even today. Central America is unstable, chaotic, and has one of the highest murder rates in the world. If we at the Tobin, who are here tonight, lived there, we too would be fleeing in a caravan north and seeking asylum. <laughs> Photographer John Hoagland was my partner there, and he was fatally shot in a crossfire by Army soldiers. Returning his remains to California and negotiating a settlement for his Salvadoran fiance with the great Catherine Graham was one of the most challenging episodes of my life. Christian Poveda took John's place and became my best friend. He was later murdered by Salvadoran gangs. Monica and I made a deal in early 1984. I'd quit smoking and she'd get pregnant. My handling of the whole situation had impressed editors at Newsweek. They promoted me to chief of correspondence in New York, managing their journalists all around the world. Nicholas was born as we were leaving the war zones. I was 32 years old and a new father. Five years of globe-trotting and witnessing history was turning me into an absentee father. Our second son was born in New York City, Alex, but Monica yearned for a return to Texas. We moved to San Antonio in 1989 and found a bicultural city where we could raise our kids and make a real difference. For 20 years, I did my best as a newspaper editor. And, and as Randy said in December 1998, Philip True was murdered while trekking through the Sierra Madre, home to the Huichol people. We spent six years chasing his killers through Mexico. I wrote a book about it, and I gained a wonderful godson, 19-year-old Philip True Jr., who lives in Brownsville. Monica's own metamorphosis came as a citizen scientist, a master gardener, and a Monarch Watch migratory butterfly tagger. She launched the Texas Butterfly Blog, founded the annual Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival at the Pearl, and now is leading the 300 Pollinator Garden Initiative as part of the tricentennial year. Monica and I started the Rivard Report in 2012, still aiming to, build, to help build a better city. Our sons had left for college, spent some years exploring the world, and then came home. Nicholas is a designer, <laughs> Alex a teacher. My life, everybody, is testimony that people can overcome adversity and live a very purpose-driven life. Family is at the heart of it all. Hey, there's no S on the thing, though. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, this is the part where I get to do embarrassing personal questions. Um, and we'll start me. With, the, uh, with the dark stuff there. You, you kind of really just zoomed over it in less than a sentence, but you said you left at 17 because of... Well, it's, I gave you the PG-13 version, Randy. Yes. Um, you'll have to get the book. Are you writing the book? Because uh, yeah, you talked about writing another book about this particular... You know, there are people out there that I've met in San Antonio that had far worse childhoods than I did, so I had a lot of good times, too. I just left some of the dark stuff out. And are you going to write about that? Yes, I am. And I've, when... written, I've written quite a bit about it already. I just don't have it uh, book length yet. Okay, but is that going to be your next book? It might be. I don't know what else I'll write about, so I might as well get that done. All right, now... Do you want your biography written? No, hell no. Um... <laughs> That'd be pretty damn exciting. I, I told you. Vicky tonight, by the way, that once you agree to do your Pecha Kucha, I'll agree to be the MC. Do you want to hear this guy? Do you want to hear his story? Yeah, that was a really underwhelming response there. <laughs> I think it's going to move. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so um, you were a writer for 60 Minutes? 
I was very briefly. And who did you work with there? Mike Wallace. What was that like? Well, I remember I wrote, the, 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 the one show that I wrote for him was the, the greedy Hunt brothers in Dallas, the billionaires cornering the silver market and destroying thousands of families' retirement. And I thought I did a great job, investigative journalism, and the producer came in and threw the script at me and go, this is crap. And I go, this is a good story. He goes, where does Mike stand? Where's the killer question? And I decided right then and there, Randy, I don't like TV news. You don't, well, yeah, but you have, he has the face for TV news. I've always told you that you have the face of an anchor before the Robert E. Lee thing came along here. I don't know what that's like, but. I, I've been told I have a face for radio. No, you, you don't. So, um, after all of this stuff that you, well, first of all, before I get to that, Philip True the, the young Philip, how is he doing? Because I know he had some problems. After. He's doing great. The, the book has supported him all his life. He's autistic. He is about to become uh, a radiologist technician, uh, which is really suitable to him. And uh, we love That's him awesome. very much. And uh, our families are very close. And um, it couldn't be better. And Nicholas, I'd like to apologize. It was not written with an S. So I just read whatever the, is in the prompter or on the script. <laughs> But after all of that stuff, now you, you founded the Rivard Report. And Monica now, and I did. Yeah. And, and now you're not officially editing that, but you're writing for I'm, it. I'm the publisher and editor. I write my weekly column. I have an incredible editor, Graham Watson Ringo, who came over from expressnews.com. And uh, I have an incredible staff of 20 people. I don't know if any of them are out there tonight, but they're amazing people. But they better scream because this is your... <laughs> all right, and two other things. What do you consider after all of that, and I think I remember meeting you in Central America back when you were much older than I was then, but... Uh, Still am. Yes. What, after all of that, what do you consider your biggest accomplishment? Family. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Not career, family. And how about, what do you still want to see done? A lot of these people can make big changes in San Antonio. Some of them have big money, some of them have big ideas, big brains. What do you see San Antonio missing that you want to work on in the next uh, 40 years of your life? Well, we and, <laughs> uh, and, and then what do you think they should be working on right now? What do we really need to do? Well, there isn't enough time to go over all of it, but you know, someone my age think this city is, changed in an extraordinary way over the last 20 years, but people that are my children's age don't think it's changing fast enough, and I've come around to their point of view. We need to become a more sustainable, livable city much more quickly if we're gonna compete out there with other great cities. And one last thing, what should I have asked you about that I didn't? What do you really want to tell this audience? Your one chance on the Tobin Center stage. I just wish one night, Randy, I could get in front of the camera and read the news. All right, well, let's let him get it tonight, Bob Rivard.